to the uh, award committee for this huge honor. It's really exciting to be here. And I'm very excited to share with you some of my work today. Uh, most of this is from my PhD. Um, so we're going to talk about cleaner shrimp, but actually let's start with something sort of different than that, which is this guy here. So this is Baron Jacob von Hutzkel. He was a German aristocrat and biologist. And uh, in the early 1900s, he used the term Umwelt, which translates roughly as something like self-centered world. But he used it to describe the entirety of an organism's sensory and perceptual experience. He did a number of early experiments on organisms like sea urchins, and jellies, and ticks. And from those experiments, he concluded that organisms could inhabit different umwelt zones, even if they lived in the same environment, as a result of differences in their sensory physiology. And that's because in sort of simplest terms, the sensory system is an interface between an organism and its environment. Okay, but today we know that just knowing about an organism's sensory physiology doesn't tell us everything about what it ends up perceiving. And that's because a number of different things all contribute to a perceptual experience. That's everything from the form of the stimulus itself, to the environment through which a stimulus is transmitted, the sensory system, of course, and then also perceptual processes that can occur after a stimulus is transduced by a sensory organ. And together, these all comprise a perceptual experience upon which an animal can base a behavioral response. So sort of my research interests writ large are to fill in some of these boxes in a variety of systems. And in particular, I'm interested in how animals use and perceive visual signals. So I put some examples of visual signaling traits up here, and you might notice that these are all signals that are directed at a member of a different species. And that's because that's what I'm most interested in, is when two um, individuals from different species signal to one another. And my interest in that is because you can get two very different sensory systems that are then interacting. So today I'll tell you one story about an interspecific signaling system, which is that one here. That's the cleaner shrimp and Silomenes petersoni. There's no better way to introduce you to cleaner shrimp than to just show you what they're like in action. So this is a video that I took in Curacao. There's our cleaner right at the center of the screen. Okay, cleaner shrimp are like the dental hygienists of a coral reef. Okay, they live at a set location called a cleaning station. Fish, which we call clients, come to the station, pose in the substrate nearby, and then they allow the cleaner to hop on and pick off ectoparasites. And one of the reasons that these interactions are especially intriguing is that across different reef eco ecosystems, we see that half or more of visits by client fish are by species of fish that can and regularly do eat crustaceans that are roughly the size of cleaners, right? So they're potential, potential predators of the cleaner. So this raises the question, why doesn't the client eat the cleaner? And one hypothesis is that visual signals have evolved which identify cleaners as beneficial partners rather than food items, as cl and clients as seeking cleaning rather than a meal. And if this is the hypothesis we want to explore, we can sort of rephrase this question to be how do cleaners and clients perceive one another. To answer this question, or at least start to answer this question, we need a few pieces of information. So if we're thinking about visual perception, one of the things we need first is information about cleaner term visual capability. We also need information about client fish visual capabilities. And then we need an understanding of how they're actually interacting with one another in nature. And we can apply some of what we know about their visual capabilities to start to understand how these partners actually perceive each other when they interact. So let's start with cleaner shrimp vision, which is something I bet you never thought you'd wonder about before today. So often when we think about visual capability, the first thing we think of is spectral sensitivity or color vision. There are many different flavors of color vision in the animal kingdom. And one of the primary ways that we describe them is using these curves, which are called spectral sensitivity curves. These curves have on their x-axis wavelengths of light, and on the y, a measure of relative response. And what these curves show us is basically how sensitive different photoreceptor types in the eye are to different wavelengths of light. And as a general but imperfect rule of thumb, the more curves or peaks that you have, the more colors you can discriminate. Okay, so starting at the top, animals that have only a single spectral sensitivity peak are called monochromats, and they're not capable of color discrimination at all. They likely see the world in shades of brightness. 
you need at least two spectral sensitivity peaks, like that's my dog, Lux, or this decopod shrimp, to see colors at all. The trichromatine will take three peaks is the kind of color vision system that we have, along with a number of other animals, like a honeybee or this banana spider. Um, another really common use of the color vision system is tetrachromacy, and that's usually the addition of ultraviolet sensitivity, and that's what we find in birds, many reptiles, and fish. And then there are, of course, more complex visual systems. There's a lot of pentachromatic butterflies, dodecachromatic mantis shrimp, but you don't have to worry about anything really that complex today. So I used an electrophysiological method called electroretinography to build spectral sensitivity curves in three species of cleaner shrimp in three different genera, thinking that if I you know, measured the visual capability of these distantly related cleaners, we might capture existing variation in cleaner shrimp vision. I did this in collaboration with Dr. Ken Frank, who's at Nova Southeast University. And the three species that we looked at are Lismata amboinensis uh, and Silomenes petersoni, the one I showed you in the video earlier, and Eurofiridella antiquinii. And in all three species, we found evidence for only a single spectral sensitivity. So for anyone who's familiar with PRG, these are dark adaptive PRG data, but we get three additional chromatic adaptations, and they all support this finding that cleaner shrimp are monochromats. So like our cetacean or our cephalopod on the previous slide, they're not capable of color discrimination. This is something I did in the very first year of my PhD. I started with these very colorful animals, and right off the bat we found that they're completely colorblind. So this was kind of a surprising finding. But okay, color is not the only aspect of a visual scene. And in fact, my favorite visual parameter is called visual acuity. And it's the ability to perceive detail. And acuity is hugely variable across species. So I'm showing you here just a handful of species for which we have acuity data. We have eye diameter on the x-axis and acuity on the y. And it's reported in units called cycles per degree. Don't worry too much about what cycles per degree are. Just know that higher numbers means you're capable of finer spatial discrimination. You have sharper vision. And I want you to take away a couple of things from this graph. So first, acuity is on a log scale, right? Which means that you're seeing that acuity varies by at least four orders of magnitude in animal image forming lines. So it really is highly variable. Second, you'll notice a strong and positive relationship between acuity and eye size. So we tend to see sharper vision in animals with bigger eyes. And because of tight correlations between eye and body size, that means we tend to see sharp vision in larger animals. Uh, all those animals in red have compound eyes. And because of their optics, compound eyes are always going to be acuity limited. We do see them fall out at the lower end of the acuity spectrum. And then lastly, I'll just point out, here's humans, right, up at nearly the very top. And this should be incredibly exciting to everyone in this room, because we as humans are not the pinnacle of just about any sensory modality out there. <laughs> but here we are, with some of the finest spatial vision we have in the But I would also say that in addition to being very exciting, this should be a little bit of a cause for pause, because this means that any of us who study any kind of visually guided <coughs> need to think about the fact that our study organs are very likely to not perceive detail in the same way that we do. And in fact, these differences in acuity could have really large impacts on the amount of spatial information that an animal can extract from a given scene. So you're gonna see a few images like this throughout the talk, so I'll just orient you to them now. These were made with an R package that I wrote called Acuity View, and all that Acuity View does is take information about um, the acuity of the viewer, the real size of an image, and the distance to the viewer, and it just deletes spatial frequencies that should be unresolvable by a given time. But the primary caveat here, which I really can't overemphasize enough, is that these don't really show us what the animal actually sees, right? Because a number of things can come into play, like motion or contrast enhancement, edge detection, post-processing of the image that can sharpen the end of it. But what these do show us is what spatial information ought to make it past the photoreceptor array and even be present for something like the brain post-process. So this is the Julia Child replica kitchen at the Smithsonian as it might appear to four different kitchen inhabitants. And you can see that, yeah, across those four orders of magnitude of acuity, 
there's likely a lot of large differences in how they perceive spatial detail. So we can measure uh, acuity in a couple of different ways, behaviorally and morphologically. I did that in our same three species of kingership. Um, and I found in all three of them that their acuity was about 0.1 cycles per degree. So roughly on par with our house fly. Okay, so let's recap. Um, I should admit that I started my PhD research thinking I was going to study intraspecific color signaling in kingfisher shrimp. And right off the bat, we found that they are totally colorblind. And their acuity is actually incredibly low. <laughs> so, remembering that this is a little unfair to our poor kids because this is a static image, right? But even so, that's acuity view from only a distance of two centimeters. Um, so this is where I just want to, I just want to, let's talk about fondant skill again, right? It's sort of my touchstone throughout this talk. And some of you might be familiar with making a famous assertion um, that the blue melt of a tick comprises only the smell of uteric acid emanating from a mammal and the temperature of mammalian blood. Okay, that's probably an oversimplification. But to me, what that assertion reminds us of is that animal blue melts don't necessarily need to be very complex nor do they need to be very much like our own in order to be perfectly functional for the animal in question. And so although our poor cleaner shrimp might appear to have relatively useless visual systems, we'll hold on to this idea of the cleaner shrimp and we'll come back to it in just a few minutes as we think about what might be the relevant portions of their perceptual world as they're interacting with clients. Speaking of clients, although I have a love for cleaner shrimp, they are the other half of our story. So the work that I've done on client fish vision um, in terms of color vision was really led by Dr. Lori Schweikert, who's at Florida International University. We used a literature synthesis approach. There's loads of data on fish vision because they have famously variable visual systems. So we synthesized data from 213 species of ray finned fish. And from a number of ecological predictors, we found, and this is not a novel result, so we're not the first to show this, that chromacy, or the number of spectral sensitivity peaks that you have as a fish, is most closely predicted by the depth at which you live. And for the purposes of today's story, most of those client fish that we're thinking about would be shallow, reef-associated species. So species at that depth tend to be dry, tetra, or pentachromatic. So today, just to keep things as simple as possible, we'll assume that any fish that serves as a client can see color as well as we can, or perhaps even discriminate more color. We took a similar approach for acuity. There's loads of acuity data on fish in the literature because of the fisheries industry, and people are very interested in how fish might perceive pets and lures. So we synthesized this data together. We got um, data on 159 species of fish and found that acuity in fish ranges from about one to 35 cycles per degree. I'll just note really quickly that even those high values of acuity in fish, in things like sailfish and marlin, are only half as fine as humans. But again, what matters for our story about cleaner shrimp today is those reef-associated species. And in species that live on coral reefs, acuity tends to range from about 1 to 14 cycles per degree. So to recap so far, we found that cleaner shrimp have monochromatic, low-resolution vision, and client fish have good color vision and acuity that's at least an order of magnitude finer. So let's take some of this information about vision, talk a little bit about how these animals actually interact with nature, and see what we can learn about how they perceive one another. Okay, so I will show you a video of the same cleaner shrimp species that I showed you earlier, and Salamanes petersoni. This is a Caribbean species. And the reason that I started my research with this species is because when they interact with client fish, there's already a lot of literature out there suggesting that there are a couple of behaviors that might serve as signals. So a lot of people have noted that there's a very stereotyped order of behaviors that occur in these interactions, and we just wanted to test them for signaling function as such. So these two behaviors, which I'll show you in the video, keep an eye out for, are first, an antennae whipping motion by the cleaner shrimp, and it's the very first thing that you'll see. And second, color change by the client fish, and I don't think you'll miss that one. So our cleaner is, let's see, right here, at the center of the screen. You'll see that as the client approaches, the cleaner shrimp whips those antennae. The client then adopts a pose going very still in the substrate nearby. And this one changes fairly rapidly to a dark color bar. 
cleaning then occurs, and a very occasionally during cleaning interactions, you'll see that fish jolt as if they've been pinched. And cleaning can go from a few seconds to a couple of minutes, but eventually we'll see our client return to its lighter color form. And shortly after doing that, it exits the sea. So again, the two behaviors that we're interested in are this antennae looking by the cleaner, and then that color change by the client. So what do I mean when I say we should test something for signaling function, right? Well, the, def the definition of signal has actually been really hotly debated. It's a topic of quite a bit of controversy. So just to get us on the same page, I'll tell you how I think of signal, but this is not necessarily the only way that people think about signal. So that's just the caveat there. But I tend to think of signals to be a reliable or what you might call honest signal. I think of them as having several criteria they must meet. Right, so first, a signal has to predict a state change in the receiver. It has to be followed by a reliable receiver response. Because if receivers are not responding, we know that this is one situation under which signalers just shouldn't send signals anymore and then signaling interactions can break down. Signals must also convey information about the sender's state or future behavior meaning that receivers need to be able to extract something useful about the sender from the signal, or else they should stop responding and the signaling interaction again can break down. And on average, the outcome of the signaling interaction should benefit both the sender and the receiver, or at least no party should consistently incur costs, right? Because if it's costly for one party to participate, they'll just stop participating in this interaction if possible. Now these are sort of three classic criteria that come from a lot of theoretical and empirical work. These, I would add, that signals need to be perceptible by the given receiver, right? And this isn't actually something that we explicitly test very often, but given what we know about the diversity of animal sensory capabilities, I would argue that it's important to actually understand, does the thing I think, is the thing that I'm thinking is a signal actually perceptible by the intended receiver? And if it is, how is it perceived? Because it might not really be in the same way that you Okay, so we can use these criteria to make some predictions about our potential signaling traits in cleaner shrimp. Right, so if antennae whipping is a signal, we might predict that clients that view antennae whipping adopt a cleaning solicitation pose. That's their state change, right? Because cleaning solicitation poses involve the client going very still, near the substrate, often flaring out their opercula or fins, um, and that's physically necessary really for cleaning to begin. We might also predict that cleaner shrimp that antennae with then go on to clean. That's a bar of soap, so maybe it's not totally clear in the back. Um, meaning that a uh, client that views antennae with can extract some use useful information about the future actions of the cleaner. We would predict that the outcome of a signaling interaction should benefit both the sender and the receiver. In this, place, in this case, that signaling might lead to cleaning. And we would predict that antennae whipping should be perceptible by a wide variety of reef fish visual systems because many, many different species can serve as clients. Okay, so for the purposes of today's talk, because there's a large body of literature showing how cleaners and clients can both benefit from cleaning, we'll just go ahead and assume that any signaling interaction that ended up uh, resulting in cleaning did benefit both the sender and the receiver. So to test our predictions, we went to Curacao. We put GoPro cameras out at cleaning stations, which is just a single anemone, right? A cleaner ship will live its entire life on one anemone. So you can film everything we do with one GoPro camera. So we put GoPro cameras at these cleaning stations. We recorded 133 hours of footage at eight cleaning stations. And then we brought all of that footage back to Duke and we annotated every minute of it to develop a complete behavioral histogram. And in addition to noting every instance of these focal behaviors in our footage, we also identified all of the interactions. So we define that as any time a client fish was present on the screen for greater than five seconds, so they're not just passing through, and in which we can see all of the behaviors by the cleaner and the client the whole time. Because it's not uncommon for clients to just park themselves in front of the camera, and you can't really get much information out of that other than that they're there. So in the end, we had 199 interactions between 10 species of clients and 18 individual shrimp. And what you have in each of those interactions is the order of behaviors that occurred, right? What were the actual sort of sequence of behaviors that occurred as cleaners were interacting with clients? And one way uh, to analyze behavioral sequences is using a network analysis approach. 
So a lot of you are probably familiar with network analysis. It's common as a social network analysis tool, a genotype network. In a behavioral network, your network vertices are your behaviors, right? So we have cleaner behaviors in yellow, compliant behaviors in blue. And the size of the vertex is scaled to represent the number of times that behavior was observed in your data set. And then in between your vertices, you have what are called transitional probabilities. This is the probability that once a sequence is in a given state, the next behavior in the sequence is this or that. So as an example, all of our behavioral sequences begin when the client enters the camera's field of view, at which point there's a 70% probability that the next behavior in the sequence is an attenuated by the shrimp, and a 29% probability that the next behavior in the sequence is closed in by the client. And you'll notice those don't add to 100, and that's because I'm only going to show you statistically significant transitions. We use a permutation procedure to develop a null behavioral network to compare that with the observed, and I'd be happy to talk more later if you're interested in how we do that. Real behavioral networks obviously have a lot more than two transitions. So this is a network made from all 199 of our interactions. And you can see that even after removing uh, transitions that don't occur statistically more often than chance, uh, there are still a lot of different ways by which these interactions can proceed. So we can use these networks to ask some questions about our potential signaling behaviors. So for example, with antennae whipping, we build a network from the 144 interactions in our data set in which antennae whipping occurs. We can see that it does predict perceiver behavior. In the 80% of um, instances of antennae whipping are followed directly by client closing. And in fact, the only statistically significant transition away from antennae whipping is to closing by the client. We can also look at our original behavioral sequences and see that 80% of cleaner shrimp that whip their antennae then go on to clean. So it does seem to indicate something pretty reliable about the cleaner's future behavior. And I won't go into detail here, but we've also brought shrimp back to the lab, done some experiments in a tank where we show them what we call synthetic clients, which are images on an iPad. And even in the absence of any behavioral or tactile cues, cleaner shrimp will still antennae whip at the screen and then zoom over to it and climb on at the screen. Right, so olfactory or other cues are not necessary to elicit these behaviors, which adds support to this being a signaling behavior and not, for example, an olfactory sensing behavior. Um, with regards to our perception criterion, we made these Acuity View movies, which hopefully will build this functionality into the package soon, so stay tuned. But this is using um, Acuity data on the reef, which is the highest and the lowest known Acuity, and from a viewing distance of 30 centimeters, which is actually about twice as far as these interactions tend to occur. Uh, but what you can see is that even for the reef fish with the lowest visual acuity we know of, antennae would think ought to be perfectly resolvable by that perceiver. Okay, so we have seen from our networks that antennae whipping is reliably followed by a, a stereotyped response in the receiver. It does seem to indicate something about the sender's future behavior, and it's at least resolvable by a variety of client vision tool systems. So what about that color change behavior that I showed you in the video earlier, right? Is that some kind of signal as well? Well, rather than walk you through the same network analysis approach that I've just shown you, I'll instead just kind of summarize our results, which are that there are two different pathways by which cleaning can occur. The first is the one I just told you about, right, which is that when the client arrives, about 80% of the time, the cleaner whips its antennae, signaling it intends to clean. And 80% of the time that that happens, the client closes, saying, okay, clean. And 70% of the time that that happens, cleaning does occur. We do see clients change color in this pathway just at variable points in time, but very often before cleaning begins. But what we see is that actually about 20% of the time, clients arrive at a cleaning station and there's no antennae whipping. Right? So what's a client to do? They've arrived, but there's no indication of whether they're going to get clean. So at this point in time, we see that about 5% of clients just leave. Maybe they go to a different about 35% of clients adopt that clean solicitation pose, but they don't change color. And about 60% of clients adopt the cleaning solicitation pose and then change to their darker color morphing. For those fish that pose but do not color change, they have only about a 15% chance at that point in time of getting clean. 
whereas the clients that do adopt a darker color more, more than triple their chance of getting seen to 50%. So this kind of suggests that color change by clients might be a signal by which they can indicate, no, I'm really here for cleaning, or I'm not a threat, or something like that. We have a lot of work left to do to understand this color change behavior. Now, you might be saying that's cool, but I spent the first 10 minutes of my talk telling you that cleaner shrimp have monochromatic, low-resolution vision, right? So what use is a color change signal? And this is, again, the final time we'll sort of channel Von Hoekskull and remember that monochromatic, low-resolution vision is not useless vision. And if we think about the form of the signal, clients arriving at large, this color change doesn't involve any fine spatial detail. It's at a very close viewing distance. And also, what we perceive as a color change is very consistently across three fish species, a change from light to dark. So I've been showing you goat fish because they're beautiful clients that turn to this gorgeous dark red color. But we see fish like surgeon fish and tanks show up in light blue coloration and turn nearly black. Or other fish will adopt thick black bark. It's always a change from light to dark. And that's something that ought to be very perceptible by a monochromatic visual system. So by looking at vision and learning about these behaviors in nature, we can see that antennae whipping does appear to be a signal, perhaps of intent to clean, although we can do some more experimental manipulation to try to really get at what the information content of that signal is. And color change by clients likely signals desire to be clean, although again, there's a lot of work left to be but overall, if neither party does either of those signaling behaviors, we see that cleaning occurs in only 2% of interactions. So it really does look like these cleaning interactions require signals from at least one party in order to be successful. Okay, and that was the like two minute time, is that right? So in the like one minute that I have left, just in case you don't already think cleaner shrimp are like the greatest species ever, I just want to tell you about a little bit of you know, my thoughts about where we go next with this system, because I've been very excited to talk with you at this conference about what to do. So I really think of cleaners and clients as a potential model system for understanding the evolution and dynamics of signals that occur between species, because our understanding of interspecific signals is lagging behind our understanding of signals that occur within a species. And cleaner shrimp just have some beautiful properties that I think will make them an excellent so for example, these are three species in the same genus found in the Caribbean. The Peterson shrimp on the top is the one I told you about. It's essentially an obligate cleaner, or it gets a lot of its food from cleaning. Yucatanicus is our middle shrimp, rarely clean, but will occasionally clean. And the Rathbuni shrimp on the bottom never cleans. So we have these groups of species in different ecosystems that exhibit sort of a gradient from an ever cleaner to an always cleaner. What can comparative work from those species tell us about how cleaning might arise? There's also intriguing hints of like convergence of signal form between cleaner genera around the globe, in that most cleaner shrimp species have white body parts that they wave around in the presence of clients. And we don't see the same thing in non in related non-cleaners. Right? So these white body parts, are they all experiencing? There's a lot of work to be done there, and highly understudied, you know, the majority of decapod crustaceans we don't even have good photos of. Um, but if they are all signaling traits, that opens up those sensory ecology questions about why white signaling traits, right? Why would this be the signal form that cleaner shrimp are hitting on to communicate with clients? And then lastly, regardless of which ecosystem, which reef I visit around the globe, you see that dozens of different reef fish can all serve as clients. And they all seem to know where communications are located and what to do when they get there, right? To adopt this cleaning solicitation pose that's a pretty vulnerable pose. They're just lying out there in the substrate. They often turn dark and become very distinctive, right? So how do they all do that? How do they all know? Are these learned behaviors? And who must they learn from if they are? And if they aren't learned behaviors, are they genetically controlled? We really don't know anything about how mutualistic behaviors arise in individuals on either the And so please come and find me. I know it's the last day of the, talk, of the conference, but I'd love to talk with anyone who's interested in these ideas um, about whatever you think about them. 
And with that, I would just like to really thank ASN for this huge honor, my chance to share um, some work with you guys here at this conference today, and a load of collaborators, um, support group, and funding sources that have helped me. So thank you very much.